Good morning, my friends. Wherever you may be in the world today, Alan Clements here from Hawaii, the occupied islands here in the middle of the Pacific by the United States. Uh, today, October 23, 2021. I hope this finds you joyfully uh, in your spirit, in your heart, with your family and your friends and your and your wonderment. Uh, thank you for joining me on this series in my life in this provocatively, incredibly provocative time. Uh, today is the fifth talk in this series, uh, a Mavericks master class on creative expression, creativity, both as an art form in living, how we think, speak, act, interact, that Dharma artistry, I'm very fond of that term, uh, bringing novelty into timeless teachings, bringing uniqueness into meditation. Uh, one size obviously does not fit all. A fingerprint is unique to every individual. A mind print, a heart print, a soul print, a uniqueness print. It may be centerless without so-called permanent essence or soul, uh, but there is a uniqueness clearly, and that uniqueness to me, to, to situate within uniqueness, means, at least to me, the ability to bring forth the evidence of that, that specialness, that radical specialness uh, called you or called me. And so today's talk, today's sharing, there's so many topics about I, I wanted to share. I wanted to actually do talk about psychedelics and creativity, uh, but I'm going to wait for that. I also want to talk about the pragmatism of creating a memoir. People have been reaching out and asking, you know, can you talk to us about the creation of a book? And I'm going to take some time for that. And what about public speaking, art, performance, live streaming? I just want to use my voice. I'm going to get into some of those things too in the coming days. But today, uh, the issue of frequency, uh, resonance and flow, I know these are buzzwords. They've been used for a little bit. Uh, They've been part of my personal vocabulary for some time. And I want to, to dive into frequency, uh, resonance, um, and flow, and in parentheses I put, and beyond at times, which could be, uh, call it hyperflow, or luminosity, or, you know, ascension, words that point to something uh, larger than what feels to be a timeless movement through time and space. Uh, I'm not looking for oneness or transcendence, but a, a radical hyperflow, if you will, of, of intuitive information surfacing unexpectedly, but you have created the atmospheric, cognitively ecological ground, heart, space, transparency, whatever you want to call it, where information is arising from the primordial sources. And one could even say that they're in a, an enlightening stream, transflow. Uh, so, Welcome to today. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I'll just dive in in my typical manner of just being spontaneous. Um, doing beautiful things for yourself and for your intimates is something very wonderful for me to to think in those terms. Uh, I've been, I posted today on Facebook and Instagram, just a spectacular new 
way of beautifying my day, which is to go to the beach here on the island of Maui, where I joyously now look forward to, to the engagement of, of the fullness of existence, if you will, both my interior and the elements and allowing a mindful association with energies different than thinking things through. Getting down deeper into a more, call it cellular, emotional cellular, call it the frequencies of feeling. And I do believe quite clearly through my meditative practice and yoga practice and psychedelic research that existence is a very not so subtle. It's very in your heart and face and body all the time, uh, but it could easily be neglected that we are living in this radiant field of intersecting energies and frequencies and what we anoint as states of mind, love, <clears throat> patience, determination, meditation has shown me, maybe it's shown you as well, that these states of mind are not so-called tangible words in consciousness that point to an emotion. In fact, it's so easy to neglect the, the emotionality and then the, the more intimate intelligence of the emotion by staying in somewhat of a surface conditioned response relationship to words in mind, thinking that life is about thinking about life rather than so-called seeing that words are just surface mosaics to the waves, the oceans and the creatures and the angels of sky and water and earth and the elements of totality. In these little fictions, you know, and I use the word fiction very carefully here. It's like there's no way to substitute. I'm going to have tea and trust that that language in consciousness would suffice to actually make tea and drink it and say no more about the, the action of breathing, although it's instinctually inbuilt into the biological existential makeup. The word itself is very different and it's very different to think about walking on the beach and actually participating in the meditative absorption, if you will. That's what I'm trying to get to here. The meditative absorption in it being an artistic, creative event that supports a more intuitive relationship to atmospheres of feeling and intuition. and. Again, coming back to this particular opening theme, doing beautiful things for oneself, like watering the plant, <laughs> nurturing the soul, uh, opening the mind, opening the heart, freeing it from very much the, you know, very debilitating at times uh, complexities of being compelled to perceive existence to the point where we live in mental fatigue, we live in uh, states of despair, we live in, in, in a breakdown space. And many people I know, many people I know have gone through uh, what I would call not a breakdown, but a forced metamorphosis where they're compelled to re-examine, so to speak, who and what they are. And so, you know, the resilience to me here is very much an element of creativity and doing beautiful things, in other words, is a way to not only protect the sanctity of your innate holiness and to worship at the altar of your goddess, your God, on a more regular basis than, than say, Sunday at 10 or 11 or 9 or 6 or whatever you do, but to make our day an expression of the holy, the nuministic, to embody the frequency, resonance, flow, and hyperflow of the word religion, how to embody Jesus as a living, breathing experience of now, 
I love reading the Bible. I love reading the Tipitaka, the Buddhist teachings. I love reading philosophy and poetry and biographies. But it's what I bring out of those pages that anoint me with the living spirit, so to speak, the living spirit, doing beautiful things, walking on the beach. And walking on the beach for me is not so much a way to process. There's something that goes on in the process by simply allowing the atmospheric flow of thought and feeling and imagination. And every now and again, I go, aha, okay, wow. And I feel this kind of dopamine, mind, cognitive, neurological, I dare even use this word, reset. But there I did. And all of a sudden I'm feeling like, okay, wow, I'm in a rhythm, rhythm. Art, creativity, love is so much about rhythm. Those of you who are yogis and meditators, so much of my referencing comes back to my beloved time in a monastery in Burma, where you really must learn frequency and flow and hyperflow and resonance. Everything was directed to the capacity to enter this atmosphere called consciousness. And just like I'm not an astronaut, but it was very easy to compare meditation in the intensive environment, a creative incubator. incubator. You really are face to face with you, unfacing, unmasking, becoming more and more intimately naked and lovemaking, naked and lovemaking with new and equally worn out identities. Aha, aha, release, release. So a lot about frequency is understanding contraction, contortion, distraction, preoccupation, superficiality, uh, habit, addiction, and a reverence for novelty. I think the artist, the yogi, to disavow her or himself from the innate natural prediction of what an insight might feel like, to relax the unrecognized, say, hold or expectation. You know, projection is the enemy of peace. And projection infuses cognitive space with an idea of something yet to be experienced. It's an expectation, a hope. And when it calcifies, we live in the dream of that Taurus in the sky embedded on infinity called, I was born in this particular time of the year and I'm a Taurus. But in the sky, there is no bull. The bull is looking down at consciousness and saying, that's just your projection. It's called BS. And so much of art is dropping the bull or the Taurus or the astrological configuration of projection in the sky of consciousness. So the first here is about frequency. It's all about frequency, studying the spectrum Meditation for me is studying on an experiential basis the spectrum of emotionality within the field of the sky or the earth or the ocean of consciousness. A good meditator becomes progressively more and more literate, if you will, with the frequency, the emotionality, the tonality, the energetic, the intelligence of the resonance, the resonance of the word Ah, uh, E, O, oh, U. It's a resonance. And those who understand the tonality of a particular resonance called a vowel or a syllable or a word or a concept, a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose, more refined and nuanced energetics, we begin to become more literate, to state the obvious, with frequency. And I find that those who are more and more familiar, not necessarily psychologically astute with boundaries and all the various things that come with, you know, psychological intelligence, which is a brilliance. But it's that the yogi and the meditator differ from the personal psychotherapist for themselves by a deep anointing, a deep creative investigation, experiential investigation into frequency. I choose words to use based upon both 
what I want to convey in terms of meaning and also a high regard for the frequency, the tonality, getting into the word resonance here. How it feels. You can say one word a thousand different ways based upon, or at least ten different ways. I don't want to exaggerate there. Ten different ways by inhabiting the resonant frequencies that discern the bars within the concept. And that provides what I would call dimensionality. And the more and more fluency within frequency and resonance provides flow. There are a lot of people, obviously, who live in mansions who have no flow. There are a lot of people who live with a lot of wealth who have no flow. There are a lot of people. I don't know a lot, but there are a lot. I've met a lot. I don't know them personally on a very regular basis, but there are a lot of people who have very little who live in hyperflow. What is hyperflow versus the containment within the, the dungeon of your wealth and your status, your privilege, your so-called projected beauty, your status, your privilege, your projected beauty, your need for profit? There's not much regard for, for resonance, tonality, self-respect, and the hyperflow of a type of luminosity that says, aha, uh -huh, I want to expand beyond my existing ideas of my identity. Therein lies novelty within uniqueness. We reinvent our creativity by exploring how we can relax into the zero gravity and not fearing that we're going to fall or die or the parachute won't open. There's not going to be a ground here. Life is groundless. And so we release from the familiarity of regular habit patterns of cognitive prose and poetry. And that's called writer's block for me. That's creator's limits. It's imagination here. And I know I'm speaking fast and I'm speaking about very complex sensitivities. But in fact, those of you who can discern what I'm saying through what I'm saying rather quickly, you know, well, I should put it out again. Frequency, resonance, flow, and at times, parenthetically, that which is beyond or integral of flow, call it hyperflow, luminosity, ascension, higher degrees of realization. Flow doesn't necessarily convey that there's insight in how that flow is occurring. There are a lot of people who, who regularly dose, who, who assume that what they're in is flow, but it's habit. Habit patterns of feeling, of identity, of projection, of collusion within setting and setting, and within shaman and setting. And, you know, you break out of that. I can't, I, I can't, I, I'm not, I'm, who am I? But sometimes there are a lot of political prisoners who don't have the benefit of a luxurious environment and how many of them who live in the hyperflow of interiority because they understand, as I've interviewed them and they've told me, they understand the integrity and the intelligence of resonance. Again, these words are only pointings. It requires a deep, meticulous, ongoing relationship. And I, again, I'm going to say it again. I think the creativity meditation and psychedelics are quite frankly have been inseparable for me. I was going to say inseparable from all of you, but no, that's not true. But creativity, meditation and psychedelics, that combination is a winning combination. You include silence, boundary, and I, and I know it sounds narcissistic to empower yourself over other. I know it sounds a bit narcissistic and pride oriented. There's so much about the bodhisattvic spirit of serving and helping. But those of you who are yogis who have been nuns and monks or or just simply hear me to it's so this so incumbent upon us to reel in that externalization impulse. 
It's so natural to want to help, but so many psychotherapists and yoga teachers and Dharma teachers have become career laden by the need to commercialize their help. And it's just embedded that capitalism and commerciality and tangential consciousness are inherent in the spiritual, creative, artistic, yogic fields. But to really anoint oneself with a much more, wow, when I'm in hyperflow and flow in between both of those or one or the other or all two, the pain that you're in, the suffering that you're in, the preoccupation with the constellation of life not being right, you go, wow, I dropped projection. Wow, I'm seeing a new sky within my own being. How did I do that? The study of frequency, of resonance, and flow. Coming back to point one, doing beautiful things. It's not just another meal. It's not just another moment of Tantra. It's not just another line of a poem. It's not just another moment to look at yourself in the mirror and habitually evaluate how it's not quite the way it really used to be. You know, those patterns, those constellations are like looking at the sky and seeing Taurus up there and the, and the bull is looking down at you and saying, okay, I got the message. You're the one who's projecting. It's called BS. So when we look in the mirror, we've got a really challenge and meditation is looking in the, you know, multidimensional mirror of self-honesty. And that self-honesty isn't just looking at the crevices and the wounds and the struggles and the complexities. How many times I would watch Upandita hold up a handkerchief and see a little yellow stain on it. And he would ask someone, what do you see? And he'd say, so often they would see the yellow stain and not the handkerchief, the white handkerchief, or it was pink or blue, but they would see this, the contrasting stain. We look in the mirror and we could be these breathtaking angels and we see the stain, <laughs> we see the wrinkle, we see, we see the limit. And so doing beautiful things is not just, you know, I have the blessing right now temporarily to drive and to walk on this, this angelic monastic beach. And there are people out there smoking, they're missing the point, but they're doing what they need to do on the beach. For me, I'm doing what I need to do, which is the immersion in frequency. Drop all ideation. It is not a time to take notes. It is a time to immerse in this rarefied configuration of, of frequency meeting resonance and tuning that resonance like a psychic or cognitive musician artist with how you want those frequencies to be felt rather than just trusting in the naturalnesses of eye and ear and nose and body and tongue receiving light and air and wind and biological blood and oxygen, you're tuning. Yesterday I spoke about the Pali Buddhist word soma, S-O-M-A, attuning to the frequencies of love, attuning to the frequencies of creative intuition, attuning to the free flow of biological cognitive energies that refuses to participate in the propaganda that something's not right. And I have seen people who were dying with tumors and illnesses and diagnoses that are inoperable and go into those heightened degrees of resonance by the study of frequency. And they have removed from the field of inner beingness those dissident misinformation propagandas that this is wrong. And they have made it not just accepting it, they have created hyperflow. And it's breathtaking to see at times, and I've had my experiences. I had a very traumatic car accident when I was 16. 
undiagnosed traumatic brain injury that affected me for decades, it probably still does, along being on the spectrum with Asperger's and Tourette syndrome and narcissistic denial and all kinds of other struggles. But I'll tell you, you know, the pain that I had in my head, the migraines, the knee pain, the chest pains, it took a long time to deke effects from the attachment to those pains and to reverse that into the study of a resonance that relaxed fear and attachment and grasping and deep down in deep to the memory of those way down deep traumas and to release them into the hyperflow of a transcendent freedom from them. And equally, my point is that a lot of those things, I no longer have migraines. I no longer have back pain in the way that I did based upon that car accident. You can heal, you can transcend if you study frequency and resonance and participate in the study of frequency by the study in, of, of, of resonance. Resonance is learning tonality of how to pronounce something skillfully. You can skillfully pronounce something deliberately inappropriate, no, or I mean unorthodox, an unorthodox pronunciation done with wisdom makes it satirical, makes it comedic, makes it humorous. So humor is a frequency. Satire is a frequency. Comedy is a frequency. And the artistry of those frequencies comes back to creative intelligence. And creative intelligence for me is informed by what I call mindful intelligence. I wrote down a list of the attributes of mindful intelligence, which I'll speak about in the coming days. And I know it sounds complicated and you know overly intellectual, but it's not. But it's trying to put words into the atmosphere of a predictable habit and to engage consciousness with a deliberate understanding of the content of consciousness. That's called Dhamma. So the heart of beautiful things, the heart of creativity for me, is the study of Dhamma, the experiential study of the frequencies of Dhamma. The frequencies of Dhamma here are what contracts, what distorts, what the, the functions of projection, of blame, of judgment, of, of, of impatience, of worry, all of these are frequencies on the ocean or the field of consciousness. And resonance is a willingness to use mindful intelligence to create a positive resonance from the frequency. I'm going to transform fear into the resonance of patience. It's not a language dance. It's not a, a verbal exchange with your therapist alone. Those words point to energy and action is the transformation of frequency, which is the deliberate intelligence of resonance. And when resonance is more mature, it moves into flow. These things become so natural, very much like a child. I was reading somewhere the other day about intelligence and resonance and flow and how a father was reading a book to his child on a regular basis, not uncommon perhaps not common enough. And the father was, you know, turning pages and all of a sudden the boy started to read. <laughs> and, and the father was a little bit taken aback because he was reading to the boy and all of a sudden he didn't teach the boy to read, but the boy now was reading spontaneously. There was a high degree of resonance that was imbued in the transmission of father and son book and page and word. And so the father said, experimented by writing words down on a page and the boy knew those words and could repeat them. He learned where did that intelligence come from other than the study of repetition, frequency, mindful intelligence, and the deep interplay within consciousness of learning cohesion, learning literacy, learning familiarity. Imagine the trust of the child with the father. 
to pronounce the word properly. Dharma is properly pronouncing frequency. Proper means for me here, the skillfulness to know distortion, contraband, contraction, and how to know those textures within the atmosphere of consciousness. The textures here are synonymous with frequencies. Resonance is the mindful intelligence to make them resonant, harmonize, unify, elevate into flow. Artists, writers, thinkers, actors will do everything. Yogis will do everything to try to find flow states. And flow isn't just an issue of being mindful alone. It takes high finesse to navigate consciousness. And it's, don't, don't underestimate, obviously, the complexity of consciousness embodied within this form in a context called Earth within the seven mild atmosphere where we're alive based upon photonic resonance from a sun star 96 million miles away through a temporary lobe called a brain that's in this field called nowness and how temporary it is and how sensitive it is and all of a sudden we have degrees of dementia arise the decline so to speak of biological brain functions and neurological functions. And we're fighting constantly entropy within this dance of understanding frequency, resonance, and flow. And hyperflow here could be a synonym for realization or enlightenment. I guess what I'm trying to say here in essence is the more we do beautiful things for ourselves. May I invite you to take a week, if not just a day, but try to, try to do it for, a, well, just the weekend. What can you do that is so beautiful, so radical? What are those little things that you can do to enhance the, the resonance, the conscious decision to engage frequencies frequencies. All behaviors, all thoughts are based upon the language of consciousness, which are frequencies, they're energies. Each chaitasika in Pali, each state of consciousness has a function, a characteristic, a disguise, a near enemy, a manifestation, a characteristic that's both unique and common. And a yogi is an individual who employs the quality of awareness and intelligence to study the textures or the frequencies of states of mind. You cannot get by in a monastery or a retreat with a good Kalyanamita by languaging your way through meditation. <laughs> good teachers don't want to hear what you think about your practice. They want to know what was the frequencies that you encountered it's a little known secret. And they want to know what your resonance was with it. How did it impact you? What did you do with what you felt and saw? How did it behave? And then what did you do? To repeat the action to increase flow. You can't get obviously into flow without the study of frequency. And the study of frequency is inhabiting wisely and skillfully a more passionate relationship to resonance. Resonance is imbued, informed by the power of creative intelligence and mindful intelligence. Mindful intelligence is the conscious employment of mindfulness with discernment, with critical, critical intuitive thinking, not just ideation, with patience, with determination. These are just words, but a yogi understands them to be felt frequencies and she or he with some skill not a whole lot of skill, can begin to discern A, B, C, D, E, F, G. They can begin to see what love is from fear. Joy is from greed. Wisdom is from ignorance. 
projection is from reality. And you begin to go, aha, uh aha, -huh, aha. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden, when we increase to state the obvious again, but so easily overlooked, when we're in a more frequent level of turning that from a resonance, the resonance emerges from noticing to insight to a wisdom. Wisdom is a synonym or the function or the characteristic of wisdom is to see frequency rightly. But what it delivers is flow. Freedom is flow. Touch and know, easy go, freedom flows. Touch and go. Touch here means, aha, uh -huh. when I'm walking on the beach, there are times when I'm feeling my feet just go into the sand and textures and moisture. Other times it goes through the fluency of just what feels to be the wind on skin, the eye on space, the water on my glasses and my eyes from the rain and the mist, the wonderment of the rainbow, the imbuing into the rainbow of something magical, how conditioned that is, how easy it is to feel other beings based upon what you sense they may or may not be feeling. I look at the children, I see the animals and the dogs. I do what I can to imbue the time with interactive intimacy by smiling or a little gesture of a smile or a wave, but keeping right down deep inside of my own soul, mind, body with the feeling of the frequencies and resonant engagement. Keep in the flow, Alan, keep in flow. Stay in resonant, awakened presence. Stay present with the sensations of existence within your mind and body. Release ideation, release aneurysm, release suffering, release insecurity. These are all frequencies. Insecurity is a frequency. It's a constellation of energies in consciousness that could be discerned by the label of fear, insecurity. But if you stay on the label level or in the projection of why you're afraid, you can easily stay in the habit pattern for a lifetime. I'm aging. I'm uglier. I'm dead. <laughs> it's just the absence of passion to imbue mindful intelligence with the radiance of Dharma artistry or creative intelligence and engaging this incredible mystery without the cliches out of India and Burma and Vietnam and America, without the cliche of all these ordinary multi-faith appropriations, drop Hindu, drop Buddhist, drop Christian, drop all of it, and art is the novelty of what you mean, Alan Clements, by freedom. Not what the Buddha meant. What does Nibbana mean as a living, breathing existence in your own mind-body process? What does unconditional mean within a field of conditions? My God! You know, and to get right down deep in the sensitivities of that beautiful field of being and feel what is the truth of what you're feeling. Therein lies right there the intersection between frequency and resonance and flow. I use those words to really disavow myself, not you, but to disavow myself from religion, from spirituality, from dogma, from orthodoxy, from tradition. They allow me more spontaneity, more, more improvisational flow. And from that, a more creative outcome that in a pragmatic way, and I'll go into these in the coming days before this 11 part series ends on the 29th on, you know, what are some of the 
pragma, pragmatic ways to create a book, a memoir, to create an album, a spoken word album, to, to, to create a solo performance, to do a live stream. What does it mean to, to meditate as an act of creative intelligence? To, to, as I would walk on the beach, how to meditate as I'm walking on the beach, how to embody a meditative practice to help study frequency in resonance, flow, and at times hyperflow. So I'm going to close here. Um, think of some of the times in my life where I've given myself really I would call it an environmental practice rather than a, a yoga practice or a sitting meditation practice or an eating meditation practice. An environmental practice is a, is a, is a, a specific behavior, like going to the beach to me is an environmental practice. It's a specific movement to a place to then beautify the experience with the felt relationship of frequency, resonance, and flow. And from within flow, it's not just to be in flow so that I can feel that I'm flowing in a hyperflowed state of realization, but as an artist, I'm accessing that reservoir of novelty. And so I come back or I'm in the car, I'll, I'll, or in the evening where I really spend deliberate sacred time to write, but I, I don't use the word write to write. I, I quite frankly loathe writing sentences. It's the last thing you do when you do a book is to write a sentence for me. I start with words and phrases and ideas and string them together. I do everything I possibly can to write layer after layer of outlines and flesh them out with, I even use the word, I don't even want to use the word, intuitive points rather than bullet points, intuitive points of reference, intuitive points of resonance about frequencies. And then you have the outline, then you have to feel it. So these environmental practices. I once took myself out of Burma and went to Sri Lanka. And on that sacred island, magnificent island, truly a magnificent place on this planet, at least it was for me. And I went to a, an isolated monastery that was a separate island in a large lagoon in the south of the island of Sri Lanka called Pogastua. Maybe some of you have been there. It's, uh, it's an island that was created, the, the monastery on it was created by uh, some German monks in the mid 1800s and I went there to live. It has no electricity for the monks that live there. There's, I think there's 10 or 12 cottages on a five acre island and it's totally virginal and there you have a well. You, you create your own uh, toilet outside in the jungle. Uh, there's no money, there's no cooking. Villagers will come from the, from the, the mainland about a mile away, I think, and bring food to the island where they offer it freely to the few monks that are there. I went there to totally go away from urbanization. Rangoon, those of you who know, is a busy, busy city. And the monastery where I lived, 20 acre monastery in the middle of the city. And even though at that time, it was an ancient set of intersecting villages, 
still there was a lot of noise. On Pogastua, the island, there were still some human-generated sounds occasionally outside, but for the most part it was unthinkable, the most pristine nature I've ever been in. It's, it's a little bit like my walk on the beach every day, although you do occasionally hear one of those massive planes taking off. But by and large, it's just you on you feeling nature and God. And you are so supported in either dealing with unrecognized habits and repressed influences within consciousness. Because you're in nature, you're alone and you're in silence and without all the distractions that we normally, I don't call, that's not right, Alan, to call them distractions. All the normalcies of normal life you no longer do. I mean, it's amazing when you don't cook for yourself and food is provided. You don't even ask for what you eat. You just simply eat what's offered. And if you don't like what's offered, you don't eat. And wow, this, you never knew that 24 hours in a day could be so long and equally breathtaking that you give your whole day over to the walk on the beach, sitting on the beach. You're now sitting on an island hermitage that is ancient and virgin and the cacophony of elements, the frequencies of the animals, the diversity of nature. They have a thing called the cobras. They're like, you know, crocodiles, massive lizards, like Komodo dragons that are four, five, six, eight feet long. That, that live in pods and herds, both they're amphibians, they're in the water, then they come on to the, to the pathways. And their energy is so extraordinarily intense, like the, the, the sea turtles down at the beach. They're, they're breathtaking, prehistoric, cosmic, existential vibrations. That's how I see them and feel them. And what happened for me through my own meditation practice, being there just in that environment, an environmental practice, this is by way of creating art studios, creating a temple out of your home. Although you have many things that reflect the iconography of Asia, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a sacred space. How do you sanctify the space with resident study of frequency to get into flow states hyperflow states, and that's what happened for me on the island Hermitage. As I got quiet and felt more, everything became more pixelated. It became more psychedelic. I literally felt that I was on a high dose of acid most of the time. Why do I say that? Because I had no hallucinations. It was a hyperflow state. There was no ayahuasca element to it. There was nothing visual. It was all a resonant sense of sensory heightened perception. Those of you who know or live in a more psychic, intuitive clairvoyance or telepathy, you know the challenge of living in a psychic field where the frequencies now are not a car, a motorbike, a plane, a rooster, your own bodily functions, your music, your heartbeat occasionally that you feel. You're feeling that you're in a field of dimensionality, right? And this is the hyperflow state that I've experienced at times. And it's not just at the Island Hermitage. This was back in 1981, for God's sake. Um, but I began to hear I would call it forms of music, the musicality of consciousness that felt and was heard as if it was being created by deities unseen and known beyond the vista of my perception. But the, the sequence of musicality so superseded anything I'd ever felt or known or heard musically. I knew that I was in the field now of the celestial ear they call this in Buddhist Pali meditative language, the emergence of an abhinya, 
the hyper knowledge, the hyper flow of tuning in on a resonant level to existing frequencies, transforming frequencies of normal auditory awareness, sensitizing to the sound, and then we release it from the sound of the plane and the plane and the dimension of the plane disappear into a resonant actuality of other dimensions, clairvoyance, telepathy through the ear, through the eye, through the nose. People want to die for these things. They do psychedelics all the time to access their psychological repression, their traumas. <laughs> I'm going to get into this, but it's meditators know you can, this is, bypass isn't a bad word. All of a sudden you have a chance to be a deity, an angel that no longer exists in the gravitational field of the condition of you as a human on earth in this particular time frame called today. And you want to take a hiatus as an angel, a deity, that's a resonant relationship to a new level of frequency, and you occupy that space with high hyperflow, you are transformed in such a way that it so exceeds whatever you felt that you were overcoming through investigating the trauma. It's called the displacement of trauma through beauty, not through realization of the wound. Very few people really know that. And I don't say it with a sense of pride or hierarchy, but it's, you know, a lot of trauma experts are not experts at all. They're, a lot of experts are not experts, so I'll leave it at that. I don't want to get into that comparative thing. But it's more about the island term and resident flow of hyperflow. And all of a sudden you go, oh my God, put yourself this weekend into beautiful states. Put yourself into beautiful environments, wherever you may be in the world, be in that beautiful environment, whether it be your home, if you have a beach or you have a forest, walk through the forest without your shoes. Go slowly, feel nature. Feel the frequency of nature speaking to you through your body. I cannot tell you, I, I rarely use the word, those of you who know me know that I rarely use the word healing, but I actually dared to write it and put it up on Instagram. I feel that I'm not only blessed, but I feel that I am actually truly embarking. I took a walk with a friend yesterday on the beach and we talked about, and she asked really, what am I feeling? Which is a beautiful question. And how am I approaching my own interiority? She was very careful not to use the word healing. And I used the word, I'm doing asana, doing yoga, doing meditation, doing the psychedelic, doing the, the hyper flow of awakening. And I'm doing things directly towards my own healing. I feel that I'm entering my aorta, my heart, my mind, and my body in a way that I've never in my entire life, even on island hermitage, even in Burma, even in the crater, even making love, I've never felt this level of frequency. And I'm going, wow, I'm blessed. No, I wrote, I'm being held in the hands of God. I'll speak more about what that means to me. I want to close the pragmatism of beautifying this weekend, wherever you may be. Pound the pillow of your soul, the thunder rage of breakthrough, not breakdown. The forced metamorphosis that the life I've been living, I want to tap into my untapped creativity, my existential choir called freedom shouts on the terms of my own novelty. What is your poetry? Come on now, what are you waiting for? A therapist, a high dose of ayahuasca, ketamine, whatever you're waiting for, stop waiting. Give it over this weekend. A collective dance of beauty around the globe in solidarity, connecting our radiant frequencies let us be a constellation of Sangha energies in the world today, vibrating in our own Polgastu or make that five acres a global event. What will it be? What's your beautiful environment? Take you self, take yourself to that special place. I know we've been there before. I'm going to go right now to the beach.
and to beautify that by a more intimate felt relationship to frequency and resonance and flow. So one of the more esoteric talks of my life, thank you for tuning in. <clears throat> I lived on that island for nearly a year. It was a breathtaking, consciousness expanding, challenging experience. The hardest thing was to leave. And I left, and I'll close with this, I left because I had a vision a psychic vision that was so compelling of my Kalyanamita in Burma, the, the late Venerable Seda Upandita, who took over after Mahasi Sedo died, who was my preceptor. And I could see his face, I could hear his words. He was saying, come home, come home. And where I was, was really a resonant field of transformational energy, it was high flow. But being in communion with him in the sacredness of my sacred abode, the Mahasi Satanayekta in Burma, with my Kalyanamita, that to me was aha. Uh -huh. That's where I could increase the insight wisdom dance, where I could learn more the artfulness of taking complex frequencies into higher order resonance and to anoint that resonance with the insight, the emergence of wisdom into flow and hyperflow, into realization. My, di my desire was to go deeper into the meditative field of awakening. And again, creativity, meditation, psychedelics, yoga, diet, and doing beautiful things beautiful environments and what you do there, bring your mindful intelligence, the courageous willingness to feel the frequency of the experience on a felt level, just like the lungs feel the texture of oxygen animating through our blood. Think of the power of the oxygen molecules and the blood in radical cohesion with the brain and the organs and the kidneys and God that animate perception to give us the radiance of objects of perception and what we do with those objects of perception. Studying frequency is the study of the Dhamma. The conscious employment of Dhamma done rightly is resonant wisdom, learning the resonance of transformational wisdom and the outcome of that is freedom or call it flow and realization of flow is hyperflow. So from my heart to yours, thank you for tuning in. Have a beautiful day, God willing. See you tomorrow from 9.30 here from Hawaii. And may I encourage you a final time, do some beautiful things for yourself this weekend. Thank you.